So I'm really, really delighted to be here at this meeting, both for scientific reasons, because I find the topic extraordinarily interesting and relevant for my own research. And I've, I like the morning session a lot, but also for personal reasons. And to explain the personal reasons, you have to indulge me two or three minutes of autobiography, if you don't mind. So the story begins in Haifa in 1935, and some, one night some Arab fishermen went out into the Haifa Bay, and they found something and brought it back to the shore. It was much more profitable than fish. It was my grandparents who in that way had beaten the uh, British blockade. And later that year, my, my mother was born in Haifa. This is, uh, I think, what Haifa looked like at about that time. And then a few years later, they, my mother's family got a visa for the United States, and so they entered the country legally for, for once. So that's where I was raised. <coughs> but um, when I was a few years old, my family came back to Haifa for a visit. Um, I think people from Haifa recognize this area and certainly recognize this area. From the photo, I, this gave me the chance to go back to photo albums, and it seems like my feet never touched the ground in Haifa. I was always <laughs> in somebody's arms, on somebody's shoulders, on somebody's back. Um, but I came back, I've been back uh, several times to find, to visit my cousins and my family, and it's always been really fun. This is the first time I've been to Haifa as a scientist, so this is, uh, sort of adds something to the trip. And so I'm happy for this opportunity. So on to, <laughs> thank you. So on to, the, on to the business. The generative and receptive modes of sensation, the rat whisker system. So let me add that at Trieste, we also, like, like at Haifa, we have a view over a bay. It's the, the Gulf of Trieste. And this is from, as, uh, as Shimon knows, this is the view from my office. <coughs> so it's, it's like here, a very nice location. So what is going on in your brain, or as in our experiments generally, in the rat's brain uh, that makes it experience uh, the world the way it does? So of course there are things around us there's, that we know exist, but the reason we know they exist, or our experience of these things, is all from the activity inside the brain. So somehow the activity inside our brain makes us recognize and experience the world. So how can you solve this, this problem. It's immensely complex and it seems practically impossible, but we use a, a, an approach that I think also has historical origins. This is the Beyustan inscription from the Emperor of Persia to introduce another hot topic. Um, the Emperor of Persia from 2,500 years ago, this was at his burial site, <coughs> and this hieroglyphic language was not understood in modern times until about the 1880s when a German archaeologist made the discovery that the same text that's written here in an ancient Persian language, which was not understood at that point, was also written in two other languages which, of which there is some small amount of knowledge. So by putting together three different scripts, each of which was to some small amount known, by the correlations, it was possible to actually decode the languages. Uh, and this was sort of the, uh, what's it called, the Rosetta Stone of, of the Persian languages. So we have the same problem. Uh, we try to, in general, form the same kind of solution. That is, we have, we're trying to find a language, the neuronal language for perception, and we have three, we try to quantify three things. One is the sensory input, so what actually goes into the brain. We try to quantify the neuronal activity that occurs when that sensation occurs. And we quantify the percept expressed uh, that's experienced by the animal. In a way, this is the hardest one, because how do you know the percept of an animal? When we do human psychophysics, we just ask, the, we ask for an answer, and we get an answer. You can ask rats, but they don't tell you. Um, the only way they can tell you their percept is if you train them to take an action based on their experience. So you train them based on one sensation to take one action, on another sensation to take another action, and you measure, their, you measure their behavior. So from doing these three things, at the same time, we try to decode the language. The system that we use is the whisker system. 
Whiskers are found in all mammals except humans. Well, humans have whiskers, but they're not much of a sensory system. But as a sensory system, they're found in all mammals except humans. And there are a number of sensory systems that are particularly well specialized. The seals uh, feel vibrations in the water, and they can follow fish from water vibrations picked up through the whiskers. The Etruscan shrew is the tiniest existing mammal. It weighs just a few grams. And its tracking of animals is uh, done through the whiskers. And then, of course, the laboratory rat, which was chosen as a laboratory rat animal for completely different reasons. But it turns out, fortunately, for, for systems neuroscience, that it has a wonderful whisker sensory system. By expert, I mean that they're fast and accurate. Uh, so you would, for example, consider the primate visual system to be an expert system because it's fast and accurate. This is also an expert system. So the main point I want to make today is that there are two ways that the whisker sensory system uh, functions. At least there may be more than two ways. We're currently following two to the idea of two lines of uh, function. One is what I'll call receptive perception, which means that the world, the external world, in a sense provides the energy that enters the brain. And the function of the brain is to analyze the signals that come into the brain. The other mode of functioning is generative perception. And that occurs when the brain, through its motor systems, creates stimuli. And those stimuli then enter the brain. The distinction is that, in this case, the stimuli don't exist unless the brain creates them. And I'll show you an example of that in the rat whisker system. So to, to focus for a moment on this generative perception, it, it's not our original idea. It was known for some time. The philosopher Merleau-Ponty said, knowing touch, that is what we call sort of the generative sensation, generative touch, projects us outside our body through movement. There are tactile phenomena like roughness and smoothness, which disappear completely if the exploratory movement is eliminated, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, there is no such thing as texture unless you create the texture with your own movement. So for, for humans, there are many things that we feel through our own movement. Uh, this uh, expert potter is feeling the, the surface. This glass maker is feeling the surface of the, of the glass. And you don't feel just by clamping something in your hand, but by making very well-controlled, well-modulated movements. For several years, our interests in the whisker system have included texture. Texture, I think, is uh, a prime example of something that occurs through gen generative perception. As I said, there is not texture unless you create the movement. It's critical for rodents. They feel, sorry if this creates some shivers, but um, they feel other rats through, uh, through, through whisker-mediated sensation. And there's an area called social, uh, a new, new research area done by Michael Brecht called social whisking. It's about how rats whisk each other. Whisking is the movement of the whiskers to create sensations. They choose, scent, they choose uh, nesting materials through uh, feeling textures with their whiskers. They probably also select food through, uh, through whisker-mediated sensation, but that's uh, uh, hard to prove because olfaction is so important. So one couldn't say that it's only by touch. So this is what it looks like in, in experimental conditions. What we've done is just track the whiskers. And this is done completely in the dark. The rat has no visual cues. And his goal is to uh, recognize this, this uh, texture, which is made of a plate with grooves put into it. So you can see that the generative uh, perception involves this forward-backward movement, which we track here. It occurs at uh, 10 hertz, plus minus 1 or 2 hertz. And the generative movement, the generative uh, sensation involves the rats moving its whiskers along the texture and creating kinematic uh, patterns of the whiskers that distinguish one object from another. So to very, very quickly review the, the sensory system, this is a whisker follicle. This is a whisker projecting out from the skin. The whisker follicle, it's like the follicles of all our hairs, but it's much, much more complicated. Uh, in this, for these, this particular hair, there are many more kinds of receptors. They have a very complex distribution. And uh, it's distinguished by having a muscle which wraps around the base that produces produce these whisker movements. 
So uh, since it's not really the main topic, I just simplify all that by saying, okay, in the whisker follicle there are receptors, and we'll leave it at that. These are mechanoreceptors, meaning that what they're sensitive to is mechanical energy. So, so when, the, when the membrane of the receptor is stretched or compressed, channels open, action potentials are generated, and that co those go into the brain. So that's a very oversimplification of the sensory system. So the action potentials generated here in the follicle follow a pathway through the trigeminal ganglion, the brain stem, the thalamus, and then arrive in a, a whisker representation in the cortex where each individual whisker, for example this whisker, is, in, is encoded or represented by a population of cortical neurons. And the sensory system, of course, doesn't end there. Uh, there are intracortical connections to other sensory areas. There are projections to posterior parietal cortex, frontal cortex, and then through intracortical pathways to the hippocampus. So uh, I'd like to show you some of the experiments. This is one of the stimulus sets that we use, and I showed you that already in the first movie. Uh, there are uh, surfaces with different spacing of the grooves, 8 millimeters, 4 millimeters, 2 millimeter, 1 millimeter, and so on. And without visual cues, sound cues, or without odors, the rats uh, learn to feel a texture and then to make a choice to go to the left or right spout according to which texture they feel. So since we, we have more textures than the number of reward spouts, so we have, uh, for example, two textures that are associated with the same reward spout and two other textures with the, with the second reward spout. And so uh, the rat is essentially classifying textures into left textures or right textures. So a typical trial looks like this. The rat leans forward. Uh, in the forward position, he can't touch with his nose, but only with these long whiskers. Uh, on, once he identifies the texture, he turns to the uh, spout. And if he's at the right spout, correct spout, he gets a reward. This is the setup taken under visual light. It's not, there aren't the, these aren't the real uh, experimental conditions because normally it's done in the dark, but for the photograph we have light. And you can see the rat leaning forward to touch the texture with its whiskers. These are the different, the two reward spouts. There are cameras and sensors all over the place. And from one trial to the next, this motor rotates so that a different texture is presented. And I'll show you what uh, a sequence of trials looks like. This is slowed down by a factor of four. It's all happening four times faster. Okay, that texture goes away, and the same texture comes again. So he turns to the right. Next, this, this another different texture is going to come. Here it comes. He feels that, and he turns to the left. So this is, uh, as I said, expert system because it's fast. The, touches, the touch time is 100, 200, 300, up to 400 milliseconds, but usually 100 to 200 milliseconds. And it's accurate uh, in the sense that they can uh, classify four textures in, with over 80% uh, accuracy. And these are textures that, by the way, are, are rather difficult for us to do with our fingertip. So I, have, uh, I haven't done the psychophysical tests, but one paper some years ago did psychophysical tests and, and found that uh, humans, if we extrapolate to um, how the humans would do on these, these uh, stimuli, it would not be better than what the rats do. So what signals are the whiskers giving the brain? So to, to answer that, we need to look at the uh, whiskers with very high spatial and temporal resolution. Spatial just to identify one whisker from another, and then temporal to actually see the, the events one millisecond at a time of, of uh, what's, what the whiskers are telling the brain. And uh, so, so we track the whiskers. This is 1,000 frames per second. So we track the whiskers with programs like this, where Automatically, individual whiskers are followed. It's color-coded for curvature. And I don't know if you choose a whisker that you like to follow, like this one. And you can see that it's, doing, it's interacting in some way with the texture. I think, it, if I remember correctly, at this point, uh, 
it gets stuck. No. Maybe on the next t touch, this whisker, I think it gets stuck. No, it doesn't. Okay, it's a different movie. Um, but we'll talk in a moment about what are the, there, there it is. Do, do you see it stuck for a second? Okay. Okay, so, so we track the whiskers, and then we can treat each whisker as an object and get parameters like curvature, angle, anything that you want. You just fit a spline to it, and you have um, an object defined by the spline, millisecond by millisecond. Then once you get the parameters, the question is, what is, diff what is the distinction between one texture and another? So what is, wh what is the whisker telling the brain? Okay, so, uh, so curvature is, is one over the radius. And do we see differences between textures? The answer, of course, is yes. Uh, this is one set of sessions from one rat. And we, we look at one whisker, whisker C2. C2 is the name of a whisker. Each whisker has a different name. And this, these are the different textures. This is a spatial grating, one millimeter, four millimeter smooth, which means there's no, no gratings. And what you see is that on the correct trials, on an average trial, the maximum curvature per trial was higher for the one millimeter than the two millimeter in smooth. C2 difference curvature is the, the difference in curvature at different segments along the same whisker. And you can see the same trend that the curvature is higher for the texture with uh, higher spatial grading, then lower and then lower. It's interesting and Im important, I think, to note that these blue data come from trials in which the rat made the correct choice. When the rat made the incorrect choice, the differences between textures were not there, uh, giving a strong correlate, I think, for his, for his sensory input. That is, when he got input that distinguished between textures, he was much more likely to make the right choice than compared to trials in which he got input that did not distinguish between the textures. This is just to show that if you measure all different possible parameters, it's not that every parameter is informative about the texture. This is something about the angle between the whisker and the base, and it didn't di distinguish between textures, which is in a way so reassuring, but it's not everything about whisking is texture related. So to summarize, these high-speed, high-curvature events characterize groove textures. So this is a time-lapse tracking uh, where one millisecond at a time you can follow the whisker and you can see that, um, that the whisker gets stuck in the groove. It bends as the, whisk as the rat is trying to retract the whisker and then it springs free. And you see a lot of these events on, tec on textures with grooves, not on textures with, that are smooth and the higher the frequency of texture, the higher the spatial frequency, the more likely that the whisker will come into one of these grooves, get stuck, and um, that's the sensory cue for the rat. So we need also to, to correlate this, as I said in the introduction, with neuronal activity. So I won't go into detail except to say that with sort of standard neurophysiology, we can extract individual neurons in the sensory cortex find out how their activity varies according to, the, uh, uh, according to the stimulus. And this is one typical neuron, but we see this in about 25% of neurons. That if we take the time of the spike, of each spike during the time of contact, we denote that spike time is zero, and then measure the whisker curvature change. Just before the time of the spike, we see a peak about 10 milliseconds before. And that peak is very significant if we compare it to the whisker curvature preceding the same spikes but with randomized spike times. So, so what's important is the difference between the blue and the red curves. And this difference tells us that a, a sudden change in curvature is likely to produce a spike. It, pr it drives the neuron to produce spikes. And as I said, this is what we find for about 25% of neurons. The other 75% have many different kinds of receptive fields that go from receptive fields about the motor output. Um, many neurons have receptive fields that we absolutely cannot decode in any way. We don't know what drives them and so on. But you know, in a sensory system, people would like to find every neuron dedicated to specifically the function that you're looking at, but it doesn't work that way. Um, many neurons do things that are not related to your specific task. In this, yes? 
when you say curvature, does it actually mean force? Because no, we have not. We have not yet. I mean, this is something is dead, like. I mean, it's dead material. So curvature presumably means that some some force at the base. Yeah, yeah. We we haven't yet done <coughs> the modeling that we should do and we'd like to do of, of converting the actual um, shape into a force model. So, but when, what it, when we're talking about curvature, what does it mean physiologically? I think it means, I think that the. Um, Curvature is, is, I think, static force, like torque. And then the change in curvature, I think, is, a, is an acceleration within the whisker follicle. But this, uh, this definitely needs to be converted into real sort of models of, of, the, um, of the forces inside the follicle. OK, so for this neuron, um, the um, the fire, normalized firing rate per trial was highly correlated with the uh, local angle change speed. That is, um, it's, it's one of the kinematic features, correlated with, it's very similar to curvature. Uh, so if we take that value of 0.93 um, for uh, the set of neurons that we um, can de define as being uh, texture neurons, the great majority have positive uh, correlate, uh, values of correlation. A few have negative values. And in general, this means that uh, um, among texture-sensitive neurons, the majority are firing when these kinematic events occur. OK, so does this actually lead to the uh, choice that the animal makes? Well, we take the same rat and look over many trials and many sessions and find that uh, for all the neurons that we study, we put them all together, not selecting neurons in any way. Um, for the total population of neurons, on the textures with grooves, which were the ones that told the rat to turn left, the firing rate was higher than for the smooth texture. This is for the correct trials. For the incorrect trials, the code was the opposite. Namely, the neurons, the neurons on average fired less for the grooved textures than for the smooth texture. So for sort of sensory systems neuroscientists, this reversal of the, of the neuronal output correlated with the choice of the animals is very important and, and very strong because it's what you would require for any um, uh, uh, statement or any claim that the output of the neurons is actually what the animal uses to make its choice. If that's true, then when the output of the neurons changes, the, neurons, the rat should make the opposite choice in fact, that's, that's what we see. Um, it, this is the result that you'd expect if the animal is reading the neuronal output in order to make its choice. When the output is high, the animal thinks it's a groove texture. And in fact, if it's a groove texture, it makes the right choice. If the, output is, if the neuronal firing rate is low, the animal thinks it's a smooth texture. And if it's, in fact, the groove texture, then he makes a mistake. Okay. These are normalized, so we take the. What, what is the range of firing rate that you're talking about? When, when uh, the whisker is in contact with the texture, the firing rates are up to about 100, over 100 hertz, 200 hertz, so 200 spikes per second. So normalization is uh, taking the firing rate during contact divided by the firing rate for the entire session in which the electrodes are connected. So from when you first connect the electrodes to when you disconnect them, take the whole firing rate, and that's the baseline. And normalized is, is touch time firing rate divided by whole session firing rate. So to summarize, um, we tried to work out a, a, a sequence of events that begins with defining the object, uh, the object properties, which are smooth or grooved surfaces. The whiskers make contact. We find differences in whisker kinematics that are associated with the properties of the object. Namely, the grooved object produces high speed kinematic events, high acceleration, high curvature, etc. And the smooth produces uh, low speed events. The brain, neurons in the sensory system have receptive fields that convert the whisker kinematics to a probability of producing a spike. Integrating over time, 
the receptive field produces uh, an output which is a firing rate uh, going from high firing rate to low firing rate. And then in the last figure I argued that the rat decodes the firing rate in order to identify the object. So it uses the firing rate in order to make its choice. So when we talk about decoding, we have to, um, oops, we have to talk about uh, two, two kinds of decoding. And I think this is where uh, systems control, I think, has, has something to say. One is our decoding, and the other is the rat's decoding. Our decoding is that we apply methods like information methods and say, um, given this, uh, uh, the neurons' uh, output, how much information do we have about the stimulus? And if we have significant or large values of information about the stimulus, we say that we can decode the stimulus according to the neuronal activity. The rat's decoding is what leads to its behavior. And this may be a very different, he may have very different kinds of information in order to arrive at a behavioral choice than what we have. So let me introduce that by showing, a, a, again, a simplified view of the sensory motor system of the rat. This is from 2008. So now in 2012, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But this is the whisker. And everything sort of going up is a sensory system. Everything coming back down to the, whisk, to the muscles of the whisker are motor system. And there are lots and lots of places in between that are somewhere somewhat sensory, somewhat motor. But you can't really define them as being one or the other. Uh, so if I say the, the, that the whisker mo movement produces neuronal activity, whisker movement produces neuronal activity, and the rat decodes that, uh, uh, we can see the neuronal activity. but uh, the rat, by the way, that it, uh, the way that it selects how to whisk, how to move its whiskers on a given trial, produces huge amounts of trial-to-trial -trial variability. Rats, if you look at, you know, a low, if you look from a distance, the rat looks like he moves up, touches, and turns, and it's the same on every trial. When you look at high-speed video, you see that there are really a lot of differences from trial to trial. There's a lot of motor variability that produces a lot of sensory system variability. When we decode the sensory output, we apply our in information methods and so on. We do not have knowledge, we do not use the rat's own knowledge of its sensory output. So I can explain that better w with this diagram. So this is the motor, it's a sort of a uh, schematic diagram of the um, function of motor knowledge. So the the uh, blue curve shows the firing rate uh, induced by a smooth texture. The red surface is the firing rate induced by a, a rough texture. And you can see that the red, curve produced, the red curve is associated with slightly higher firing rates than the blue curve. So that's a sensory code. Higher firing rate in red for rough texture and lower for blue and smooth texture. But the stronger the rat whisks, the more it presses its whisker, the more quickly it moves its whisker, the higher the firing rate. So these curves are not, uh, are not stationary in this direction, but have a, a, a slant, so that the higher the motor output, the higher the, the firing rate. Now, if the rat has complete, uh, unambiguous knowledge of its own motor, motor output, it can decode its own activity on a given trial by making a slice through these two curves because it has absolute knowledge of its motor output. That makes the two curves projected onto this axis very, dis very distinct from each other, uh, very discriminable. If the rat has no motor knowledge, then on any given trial, all it can do is decode the uh, firing rate that occurs and then the two curves are very similar to each other. They're very hard to decode. That's the situation that we have as experimentalists. We, don't, we measure neuronal activity, but we don't know what the rat knows about its own motor output. The reality, I think, for the rat is that it knows pretty well its own motor output because it's, it's creating it in the brain and the sensory system has input from the motor system. So we think that the degree of motor knowledge is, is, is somewhere intermediate between absolute perfect motor knowledge and no motor knowledge. So we, we plot it as a Gaussian here. And since the rat knows to some degree how it's, own, how it's whisking, 
it's able to improve the decoding of its own sensory input. So that's indicated by the fact that these two curves are better separated from each other than in this case. So when, I, when we find the amount of information carried by sensory neurons, I think that this is, as experimenters, it's an underestimate of the knowledge that the rat has of its uh, motor op of its uh, sensory signal. Not to mention the fact that it has many whiskers. And it has lots of whiskers, exactly. And this just illustrates that in this simulation, the amount of information per neuron increases as the motor knowledge increases. Mm, but I don't think he would know that he's doing a texture task if we move the whisker. Um, if we move the object. And he doesn't have knowledge. Yeah. We could test it that way. And prediction would be that he has much poorer, much lower texture, his texture information if he's comparing two textures, but we move the textures rather than him. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so, um, so I've talked about the code in the sensory cortex. Uh, we wanted to find out how sensory experience is registered at the uh, end of the sensory pathway in the hippocampus. Hippocampus is the terminal point for all sensory pathways, visual, auditory, olfactory, and they're integrated together to represent a complete experience for the animal. Um, so we, we jump to the end of the, hip, uh, the intracortical pathway this is work done by uh, a PhD student of mine, Pasha Itzkov. Um, remember that the rat touches the texture and then turns left and right. People have known since the 1970s that the hippocampus has a very clear and very robust representation of the animal's position in space. So in our task, where the rat chooses between left and right, we would expect hippocampal neurons to fire differently uh, according to the choice of the rat. In fact, we find that, that uh, over half of the neurons fire very differently uh, this is a neuron that fires as the rat turns right and not as the rat turns left. The time scale here is the touch time, the turn time, and the reward time. Okay? And this is the information carried by, by this neuron. So it's a very, very strong um, spatial signal. But what about the texture itself? Does, does, the, does the hippocampus register the texture that the animal is touching? And to, to answer that, we have to compare the hippocampal response for two textures that are associated with the same reward location. So the animal takes the exact same action, uh, moves through space in exactly the same way. The only difference is the two textures that it touches. And the answer is that for 18% of neurons, uh, the response was different according to the texture itself. So this neuron fired more for this stimulus than for this stimulus. So um, the animal... Um, uh, so, so the touch signal goes throughout the neocortex all the way to the hippocampus. Uh, how does it do that? I think that this question is important. For this question, it's important to again consider that we're talking about generative sensing where the rat is producing the stimulus. So he, reach, he has a contact period, a turn period, and a reward period. Okay. And remember that he has this whisking um, rhythm at 10 hertz, which looks like this, and it's suspiciously similar to the hippocampal theta, the local field potential oscillation in the hippocampus. This is what uh, theta looks like in our task. This is during the touch time. You can see a very, very strong theta rhythm, an 8 or 10 hertz rhythm in the hippocampus, specifically when the animal touches the texture. It disappears when the animal turns and is actually suppressed during reward, um, during reward uh, collection. So this, to us, was, um, seemed like a suspicious coincidence. Why should, the hippocampal, why should the hippocampus show the 10 hertz rhythm at exactly the same time that the rat is palpating the texture? Does this actually mean anything functionally? So to do that, we, we, we've examined uh, local field potential in the hippocampus together with the whisking rhythm and the spiking of neurons in the sensory cortex. And let me give you the results verbally in, in a very short way. Uh, when the rat is collecting 
the texture information. When he's whisking on the texture, the whisking rhythm measured by this tracking program is absolutely coherent with the theta rhythm in the hippocampus. When the rat is doing other tasks, control tasks, like running around a box, it whisks, it has a hippocampal theta rhythm, but the two are not coherent with each other. They fluctuate independently. When the rat feels the texture, the spiking in the barrel cortex is phase-locked with the whisking, and since whisking is phase-locked with hippocampal theta, it's phase-locked with hippocampal theta. Okay? So during the, the time of the, um, during the time of texture uh, palpation, of exploration, of generative sensing, there's a 10 hertz rhythm that goes throughout the entire brain. It goes through the motor system, produces the, the rhythmic uh, whisker motion. That produces rhythmic sensory inputs, which then travel through the neo neocortex, we think uh, um, uh, correlate with a coherent uh, rhythm in the hippocampus. Uh, so we, we, we speculate that generative sensation is characterized by a rhythm which engages the whole sensory motor system in, in some sort of coherent way. So now I'd like to talk about, um, uh, go from generative perception to, to the second case, the receptive uh, perception, in which the the brain doesn't have to create the stimulus because the stimulus already exists in the world. So uh, if you suspect that your computer is overheating because the fan is not working, you might place your hand on the, on the case of the computer and, and feel the vibration, feel whether it's an, an anomalous vibration. <coughs> you probably wouldn't move your hand like this because then the, the vibration from move, motion would confound the bi vibration from the fan. So you would suppress your motor system and very carefully attend to the vibrations that come through the object that moves by itself. So we suspect that this also exists for rats, this kind of uh, receptive uh, uh, perception. Um, imagine it in the natural environment where it's hard for us to collect data, so this is just my own fantasy, that the rat in its tunnel uh, feels the approach of a, uh, of a predator by ground vibrations. So, uh, so, so it feels the, the walls of the floor or the floor of the tunnel vibrating with each footstep. Um, detection would be extremely important, but so would uh, changes over time. That is, is the vibration getting stronger, meaning that the predator is getting closer, or is the vibration getting weaker in time, meaning that it's moving away. So we can't, uh, we have no way to, to study this in nature at this point. But we, we made a device to study in the, in the laboratory and where we place the rat in an apparatus where it receives the vibration through a motor and we control the motor. So it's, uh, happily for us, it takes the whole motor system out of, the, uh, out of the process. We control the stimulus and based on the stimuli that it feels, the rat has to go to a left reward spout or right reward spout. So what exactly are these? Um, so, so here's what a trial looks like. The rat goes into the uh, nose poke, receives a vibration on its whiskers, withdraws, and turns to one of the two spouts, in this case, the right spout. So what exactly are the vibrations? Uh, we decide not to use a periodic sinusoidal vibration for reasons that uh, Shimon and I have, have been talking about now. Um, we choose something that's, I think, more interesting, mathematically interesting, I think it's more natural. Each vibration is defined as a Gaussian uh, in position. So that means that over time, in the vibration, there's a sequence of position values that are taken out with the probability given by the Gaussian, and the motor moves to each of those positions. So the motor is jumping around in time. The definition of a given vibration is the standard deviation of the Gaussian. So we could have two vibrations, one and two, defined as sigma one and sigma two. Obviously, for sigma two, uh, the, vib the computer is jumping around with more variance, so there's higher velocity and also higher, higher acceleration. Future work has to tell us which of these exact features the sensory system is sensitive to. We think it's a combination of velocity, or actually speed, and acceleration. We don't think even though we produce the stimuli by defining position, 
there's really no evidence, there's little evidence that the whisker system actually encodes position itself. We think what encodes is the uh, speeds and accelerations that are, that are produced by position variance. So this is what one trial looks like. Uh, the first vibration, this is position over time, so the, vi the motor's jumping around, there's a delay, and then the second one, sigma 2 is larger than sigma 1, so the rat should turn left. If, sigma, if the stimuli were, were reversed, sigma 2 is larger than sigma, less than sigma 1, the rat should turn right. So the, the trial cons consists of the rat putting his nose in, receiving a base stimulus, a delay, a comparison stimulus, a go signal, and then the choice, which looks like this. Delay, second stimulus, and you can see that it's moving more. And then he goes. Okay, so did you know, I, I think you noticed that the motor system is turned off. <coughs> so someone might, you know, in the literature people talk about active and passive touch. I don't want to call this passive touch because I don't think that anything about it is passive. We have to train the rat to not move its whiskers. So the first few days of training consist of teaching the rat to go inside the spout because there's a water reward. And then we teach it through online monitoring of the, the whisker through, the, uh, through, a, through a camera. We teach the rat to not move its whiskers. And we reward it when its whiskers stop moving. So we train it to suppress the motor system and then once it suppresses the motor system, we think it's in the receptive mode of, of operation, and then we teach it to receive these stimuli and to, to take the action according to the stimulus. So this is the perceptual structure of a trial. It, it gets one vibration, it encodes a stimulus in the sensory system, it has to hold a memory of the stimulus. It gets a second stimulus, encodes a second stimulus in the same way as the first stimulus, but then it has to compare the second stimulus to a memory of the first stimulus. So this is the cl a classical a form of the classical working memory task. Okay, so here's a trial where sigma 2 is larger than sigma 1, so turn left. And if you look at it, it's easy, right? Because, I mean, but this is a visual task. I mean, it's, it's very easy to see that these, this variance is larger than this variance. But I think for the sensory system, it's not so easy. It's a statistical task. We can see two, uh, two, two Gaussians. We can, we can fit two Gaussians, and we can see that they're very different from each other. But from the point of view of the animal, this is kind of what's happening. So intensity events, these jumps, are occurring over time. Uh, he has to mem remember them, build up a distribution, estimate the statistics of that distribution, hold the information, second stimulus arrives, he has to collect these events, try to estimate the statistics of the second distribution, and then compare that to the memory of the first distribution. Yes? Okay. Build the, whole, the entire distribution. Okay. Look at the marker of it. That, that's, that's a great question, and, and um, we're working on that. We're trying to figure out exactly what it extracts from the, from the stimulus. <coughs> it doesn't seem to be the maximum value. It does, from preliminary work, when we do um, choice probability index, as we see what it is about the stimulus, if you take a set of stimuli that have the same uh, sigma values, some of which the rat got correctly, some of which it made a mistake. You see what it is about the stimulus that predicts what uh, determines the choice of the rat. It doesn't seem to be the outliers as so much, so much as the actual statistics of the stimulus. But we're st that's just the first look at it. We're still working on it. And it's very easy uh, to do the same, exact same experiment with humans. That is, you, you ask subjects to put their hand uh, at the end of the probe that comes from the motor,
and you give to the humans the exact same stimulus to the rat as you give to the rat. Not only is it the same stimulus, but it's the same paradigm in the sense that we don't tell the rule to the subjects. We don't tell the subjects you're going to get two vibrations. One has higher variance than the other. If the second has higher variance, press this key. We don't say any of that to the subjects. We just say you're going to get two stimuli, press one of two keys, and the computer will tell you if you're correct or incorrect. And it takes them some tens of trials, 50 trials typically, to figure out what the rule is, but that's the same way the rats do it, right? Because you don't, can't tell the rule to the rat. Just discovers it by trial and error, and we can do the exact same thing with, with humans. Was humans described in a stronger or weaker? So we, we ask the, the people, and they, they give us different, uh, different, um, different descriptions. It's usually uh, stronger, weaker, more intense, less intense. Um, some subjects uh, don't do the task very well at all. Some are just barely above chance, and it's very interesting that those are the ones that give the, a poor verbal descriptor of it. There's one subject, um, usually a theoretical physicist are the, the worst uh, <laughs> subjects. So most of our subjects are, are PhD students from the university, and the theoretical physicists are, are quite terrible usually, and they, one of them who was close to chance thought it was stimulus duration, which it was not. Another thought it was stimulus frequency, which in a way it is, but that's not really it. And so, whereas the ones who say, okay, the stronger stimulus, I have to choose the button for the stronger stimulus, usually it's correlated with good performance. So this, this is um, plots from a set of rats and a set of humans. This is the uh, typical psychometric curve. If people know what psychometric curve is, I don't have to take time to explain it. If someone doesn't know, then I can explain psychometric curve. Who, un who does anyone not know what psychometric curves are? Okay, so um, this is the x-axis is sigma 2 minus sigma 1 divided by the sum. So this is the, the variance of the, the difference between the variances. If this value is positive, it means the second stimulus is stronger. And the subject should judge the second stimulus as stronger. If the value is negative, the first stimulus was stronger, and the subject should judge the first stimulus as stronger. So if an absolutely perfect subject would have sort of a step function where they'd have a value of zero here because they would never judge sigma 2 as larger than sigma 1. And then as soon as this value becomes positive, they go to 100%. So the perfect discriminator, the ideal observer, has this function. In general, the steep, so that means that the steeper the, the curve is, the better the performance. And you can see that, that humans in red are little, sorry, humans in green are little better than rats on average. There are um, rats that are better than humans in this task. And I'm, I'm throwing away the outlier humans that, that don't get it at all. Of the ones who actually can do the task, um, if you look at the distribution, the humans, on average, are, are a little bit better, but there are some rats that are, are better than humans. So uh, let me uh, uh, touch this, this concept of optimality, because I, I've heard it discussed this morning. So what is optimality? If a stimulus is perfectly defined, so all possible information about the stimulus is present in the stimulus, then optimality should should, should result in perfect performance. This stimulus is a little bit different because each stimulus is defined by sigma, but there are trial-to-trial -trial variations even for a theoretical value of sigma. So if we say the variance should be 2 millimeters, we tell the computer to produce a stimulus with variance of 2 millimeters. In reality, sorry, standard deviation, in reality it could be 1.8 or it could be 2.2. It's not, it's not always the, the exact value. Um, so, so the brain has to make an estimate. It doesn't have the exact information. It has to make an estimate. So on that basis, you'd expect that if the stimulus is present for a longer period of time, more evidence can be collected. So any Gaussian will look more like the Gaussian if more samples can be collected. Uh, and by the same token, if the stimulus lasts longer, the brain has a better defined Gaussian and should be able to better extract the standard deviation and make a better choice. So optimality says that when the stimulus is longer, the choice is better. If it's shorter, the choice should be less good, but it shouldn't have any particular bias one way or the other. 
And we find, in fact, that the rats do do this optimally in the sense that when the stimulus is longer, the comparison stimulus is 600 milliseconds, the curve is significantly steeper than with, when the stimulus is shorter. Are humans optimal? The answer is no. When, in the case of humans, when you reduce the stimulus length, instead of having a less good estimate, uh, but a bias-free estimate, humans form a bias. When the stimulus is weaker, human subjects, uh, sorry, when the stimulus is shorter, human subjects think the stimulus is weaker, which is not the, uh, it's not the optimal extraction of the stimulus statistic, it's a bias. And it's interesting that in a completely different study, the laboratory of, of Romo made a similar observation with monkeys. They used a sinusoidal stimulus. The monkey had to compare two different frequencies of sinusoid, and the result was when the stimulus was shorter, the monkeys judged it as being weaker. And we found the same kind of bias in humans, and it's a bias that does not happen for the rats. Now, in the working memory task, you have to have many different pairs of stimuli, sigma 1 and sigma 2, so that the rat cannot uh, judge only the second stimulus. If the first stimulus is always fixed and the second stimulus varies, then the first stimulus becomes non-informative and the rat can do the task only using the second stimulus. For a true working memory task, you have to have any given first stimulus, sigma 1, followed by two possible sigma 2s, or any possible sigma 2 preceded by two different values of sigma 1. That forces the animal to pay attention to the first stimulus, hold the information in memory, and proceed to the second stimulus. This is the performance uh, for different delays in humans, where the delay is 103 seconds, 6 seconds, or 9 seconds, uh, 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 shown, shown here, where dark red means perfect performance, or dark blue means perfect performance. And for rats, we have essentially the same, the same result. So really for us, the astonishing thing, and for the people that we've, we've presented these results to, the astonishing thing is that um, parametric working memory, which people thought is a property or a capacity of, of primates, of humans and monkeys, in fact, rats can do it perfectly well qualitatively to the same level as, as, as humans. That is, they can hold information, not object identity, not the smell, not a specific smell, but actually a parameter. They can hold it in working memory and compare between two different stimuli. So this is just a reminder that, of course, our objective is to record lots of neuronal activity while rats do this task. We've just started, so I don't have uh, results on that. But of course, in the end, we want to find the sensory code for the stimuli and the working memory for the stimuli. So um, uh, to conclude, uh, I showed you before this sort of complicated sensory motor scheme. To that, I think we need to add the idea that, that there are at least two modalities of functioning. The generative or receptive mode, generative where the rat creates a stimulus, receptive where it receives a stimulus. So all of this system has some top-down command um, which is fed to it, which says, according to the task, according to what you're doing now, you should suppress the, the motor system and concentrate on picking up sensory stimuli, or in another task, you should generate the stimulus uh, to, create, to create the sensory input. So I'd like to thank you for listening and uh, thank the, the funding for the laboratory from uh, European Commission and foundations and a really nice group of students. Uh, these, the, the guys who set up the, the experiment, the, the technician guys, Fabrizio, uh, Fabrizio Marco, and uh, Rudy. The vibration experiment is Arash, Athena, Vahid. And the texture experiment is Athena uh, and Yang Fang Zhuo. Thank you.